or from. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Sedgwick LLP, uh, David Dorson's law firm, and the Harvard Law School to this wonderful event um, discussing and celebrating uh, Mr. Dorson's biography of Henry J. Friendly, uh, the greatest judge of his era. And I think we'll have many people on this panel, uh, this very distinguished panel, who can offer us some insight into Judge Friendly as uh, a man and Judge Friendly as a judge. Uh, in 1964, Judge Friendly spoke to the University of Chicago law school students about the structure of legal education. This is what he said. He said, the legal mind is an inquiring mind. It does not accept. It asks. Its favorite word is why. It is analytical. It picks a problem apart so that the components can be seen and judged. It is selective. It rejects characteristics that are not significant and focuses on those that are. It is a classifying mind. It finds significant differences between cases that superficially seem similar and significant similarities between cases that at first seem different. It is a discriminating mind. It has a profound disbelief in what Professor Frankfurter used to call the democracy of ideas. Now, Friendly's words, once spoken to law students, foreshadowed the type of judge he would become. We've assembled a panel of six distinguished academics and judges who will discuss Henry Friendly's legal accomplishments, beginning with his time here at Harvard and continuing with his time in private practice and appointment uh, to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Let me introduce to you this panel. This is an extraordinary panel. Um, our author, David Dorson, HLS, class of 1959, is the author of Henry Friendly, Greatest Judge of His Era. Somebody hold up, hold up the book so everyone can see it. <laughs> Thank you. I've got one in my, with me, too. Uh, before he became counsel at Sedgwick LLP, Mr. Dorson was assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York from 1964 to 1969, and then served as assistant chief counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities from 1973 to 74. He is a seasoned trial attorney, and among his noteworthy cases, he acted as lead counsel in the representation of 200 women who sued the government printing office for sex discrimination that resulted in a $20 million victory. He handled a defamation suit on behalf of General yeah, Westmoreland against major television network CBS and news personality Mike Wallace, and represented the Hunt brothers before the CFTC after the collapse of the silver market. So a very experienced attorney and one well placed to investigate and analyze the work of Judge Friendly. We have Judge Michael Boudin, who really needs very little introduction here at HLS, but I'll do it anyway. After graduating from Harvard Law School in 1964, he clerked for Judge Henry Friendly and then for Jun Judge Ju Justice John Marshall Harlan II. After working in private practice at Covington and Burling for over 20 years, Judge Boudin taught here at Harvard Law School before serving in the Justice Department under Ronald Reagan as Deputy uh, Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division. From 1990 to 1992, Judge Boudin sat on the district court, uh, federal district court for the District of Columbia. And in 1992, he was appointed by President George H.W. Bush to the uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, where he is today, and served as chief judge from 2001 to 2008. And he is a frequent uh, lecturer here at Harvard Law School, so that's why I say uh, known, well known to many of you. Um, uh, Professor Dan Cocolet. I'm not doing this in any order, so I hope you will know who, I, who I've identified. This is our author, David Dorson, Judge Michael Boudin, um, and our own professor, Dan Cocolet, also of Harvard Law School in 1971, is the Charles Warren Visiting Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School, um, as, well as, as well as the J. Donald Monin uh, University Professor at B Boston College. Uh, he clerked for Judge Robert Brousher of the SJC here in Massachusetts and Chief Justice Warren Berger, the US Supreme Court. He then taught at uh, Boston University Law School, Cornell Law School, and Harvard Law School before entering <laughs> private practice at Palmer and Dodge. He served as the dean of, of Boston College Law School from 1985 to 1993 and currently serves as an advisor to the American Law Institute's Restatement 
on law governing the legal profession, a member of Harvard University Overseer's Committee to visit Harvard Law School, and a reporter on the Committee of, rules, uh, of, of the Rules of Practice and Procedure for the Judicial Conference of the United States. Also of note, he spent five years as the chairman of the Massachusetts Bar Association Committee on Professional Ethics and chairman of the Task Force on, on Unauthorized Practice of Law. He's per perfectly situated for this panel because he is writing the epic uh, history of the Harvard Law School. And Judge Friendly's uh, career began here, and he had many contacts with the law school, including the law school periodically begging Henry Friendly to join its faculty, which he never did. But um, Professor Cocolette can talk about the relationship between Judge Friendly and the Harvard Law School. Uh, we have Judge Pierre Laval of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, also of Harvard Law School, 1963. He clerked for Judge Friendly immediately upon graduation, and after that served as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York before entering private practice at Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton for six years. In 1975, he mo moved to the New York District Attorney's Office, quickly moving up to Chief Assistant District Attorney before his appointment to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York in 1977. In 1993, he was nominated by President Bill Clinton to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, where he has served since then. Also from the Second Circuit, we have Judge John Newman, Yale Law School class of 1956. Um, who clerked for George T. Washington of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, followed by Chief Justice Earl Warren of the U.S. Supreme Court. He entered private practice in Connecticut for two years and served as special counsel to the, government, the governor of Connecticut in 1960. He was an executive assistant to the U.S. Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare from 1961 to 62, and then joined the staff of U.S. Senator Abraham Ribicoff from 1963 to 64. He was the U.S. Attorney for Connecticut from 64 to 69, and briefly re-entered private practice before his nomination by President Richard Nixon to the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut in 1971. He's been on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals since his appointment in 1979 by President Jimmy Carter and served as chief judge from 1993 to 1997. Judge Newman is actually the only judge of this distinguished panel of judges who was not a law clerk to Judge Friendly, but a colleague of Judge Friendly's, serving on the uh, uh, Second Circuit along with Judge Friendly for five years. Um, and he actually was also a litigant before Judge Friendly in his uh, capacity as uh, uh, U.S. Attorney, and also in private practice, I believe. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit about what it was like to appear as a lawyer before Judge uh, Friendly. And we have... Um, Judge, uh, judge, <laughs> so many judges. <laughs> Professor Rakoff, Professor Todd Rakoff, who, after graduating from Harvard Law School in 1975, clerked for Judge Henry Friendly. And we have one more Hen that Friendly clerk in the room, although not on the panel, is a prof oh, two, I'm sorry, Rainier Crackman. Uh, professors Rainier Crackman and Lewis Kaplow, <laughs> who are here to show the Friendly flag. Um, uh, but uh, Judge Rakoff was also a uh, Henry Friendly clerk. And after five years in private practice with Foley, Hoag, and Elliott here in Boston, Professor Rakoff joined the HLS faculty in 1979. He's now the Byrne Professor of Administrative Law, and he's served as Associate Dean, Dean of the JD Program, as well as Vice Dean for Academic uh, Programming. Finally, uh, visible to all, uh, 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 presiding, as, if you will, <laughs> is um, Judge Richard Posner, a Harvard Law School uh, uh, class of 1962, who clerked for uh, Justice William J. Brennan of the Supreme Court immediately after graduating, and then served as legal assistant to the commissioner of the FTC, and then assistant to U.S. Solicitor General, then Thurgood Marshall, 1965 to 67, and then general counsel to the President's Task Force on Communications from 1967 to 68, before joining the faculty at the University of Chicago Law School in 69. In 1981, he was appointed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals by President Ronald Reagan, where he serves today, and he served as chief judge from 1993 to 2000. Um, judge Posner was neither a law clerk nor a colleague on the Second Circuit of Judge Friendly, but he served as a judge while Friendly was also a judge. Uh, and. Uh, I believe had correspondence with Judge Friendly uh, 
uh, early in his career as a judge, and he wrote the introduction to David Dorson's um, wonderful biography of Henry Friendly. So I have to say Harvard Law School is extraordinarily grateful to this distinguished panel for being here and Judge Posner for being here uh, electronically. And I want to say um, Dean Martha Minow is very sorry. She would have loved to be here. She is abroad representing the law school um, in important missions uh, out of Cambridge. But I'm sure if she were here, she would express her gratitude. Um, so I'm going to start by asking uh, Mr. Dorson, the author of this wonderful biography, to give us an overview of Judge Friendly's life and also the process by which uh, you wrote this biography. Well, the process was hit and miss, but uh, let me start with the, uh, uh, of course, um, Professor Syker has given some, but F Judge Friendly was born in 1903, graduated from the law school in 1920, uh, I'm sorry, Harvard College as a summa in 1923 from Harvard Law School as a summa in 1927 with the highest numerical average, which they had in those days until 1965, the highest numerical average in the 20th century. Uh, he then went to private practice uh, with a firm that became Dewey Ballantyne and then less happily Dewey LaBeouf, uh, and then was a founding and name partner in Cleary Gottlieb, when he was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in 1959 and died in 1986. Um, that will give some sort of context and very, very brief overview. As far as my biography, I had not had as much as a law review article published when I started it. When I say hit and miss, it wasn't really trial and error. Uh, I read, of course, every opinion he wrote. Judge Friendly wrote over a thousand. Every art, every article and comment he wrote in law reviews, which were dozens. Uh, his extrajudicial writings were primarily on constitutional type subjects, where his contribution as a judge was less pronounced. Uh, I also had the benefit uh, at the Langdell Hall had uh, Judge Friendly's papers. 105 trans files of unprocessed papers, and there were a couple of people here who were helping me over those papers over the course of many months looking at them. And most valuable to me were something called voting memos. Rather than meet and discuss orally the various cases that the panels decided, they corresponded in memo form ranging from one page or less to over a dozen pages which were an extraordinary resources. They were written in about half the cases and gave an absolutely reliable, contemporaneous picture of the thinking of the judges because they had every incentive to be accurate, not self-serving, and persuasive. So it, it was, it's a unique resource. I don't know of any other court that did that. But I also read the briefs in 95 cases so that I could compare the briefs with the final opinions, listened to a dozen or so oral arguments, uh, wrote, read every article I could find about Judge Friendly or every, and, and every single case write-up, law review case write-up of his opinions. I read newspaper articles, newspaper clippings. I interviewed everybody I could find. I spoke to all 51 of his law clerks, 50 of them in person. I spoke to his colleagues on the bench, district judges, uh, court of appeals judges, many lawyers who had argued before him, a number of the parties in the cases, family, friends, one college classmate of his who was 106 years old when I interviewed him. Uh, I just made it. Uh, he died a few months later, but he was coherent and quoted in the book. I, I spoke to Friendly's children. I, spoke to, uh, I met with 10 of his 11 grandchildren at a family outing. And uh, I tried to use everything I could uh, and make it come out with some you know, flow, uh, which was one of the hardest parts to do. And uh, that's what uh, you've seen here and we'll hear about in a few minutes. So that's the summary of my efforts. Thank you so much. Judge Posner, uh, Judge Posner, in the introduction to this book, you say, quite frankly, that you uh, are on record saying that judicial biographies are in general a bad idea, mm -hmm. um, not something you'd recommend that people undertake. 
And yet, uh, you say that uh, this one changed your mind, and that this one turned out to be a good idea. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how this, uh, this judicial biography changed your mind? Because you said if you'd been asked, in particular, whether it would be a good idea to write a, a friendly biography, you would have said no. But, but now you, you've, you've changed your mind. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, one reason is that you sh th th there's something, there's some curse attendant on judicial biographies. So usually they're written, they're completed so long after the subject has died that everybody who knew the person has died. So, um, so, so they lose any, any kind of vivid personal recollections. But of course, David was so incredibly expeditious in his completion of the biography that he was able to, to, to talk to countless people who knew, um, who knew Judge Friendly, and of course, to his family. And so it, it, there's a much more vivid picture of the personality than, um, than, than we usually get. And also, um, you know, he revealed things about Judge Friendly that I, I don't know how many people knew about it, but, you know, he, he was quite depressed, uh, Judge Friendly. He, he was not a happy camper. <laughs> And um, it's, it's actually interesting how many successful people have um, psychiatric problems and how they overcome them and, and you know, what, a, what, what terrific contributions they can make, as Friendly did. The, the, although also, although we all knew that Friendly was, you know, ex extraordinarily intelligent and, um, and such a great judge, but... Um, the biography conveys the fact that he was really a genius. Um, the way he started out, the, 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 the way he performed at college, some of the quotations that the biography um, has from uh, Friendly's undergraduate writing, um, it, it was really uh, uh, extraordinary. And of course, a lot of the and again, this is partly uh, Dorson's great uh, luck in being able to write this so quickly and relatively close, to, relatively soon after Friendly's death. He was able to talk to you know to the litigants and lawyers and all sorts of people who were um, uh, co-evils of of Judge Friendly, and in part by 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 all this research he did into the into the case is not just what's on paper, but what actually happened. Uh, one understands, I don't I didn't understand this myself, that um, Friendly was a real uh, a realist, and he was much less pernickety about jurisdictional issues than I would have, would have thought. He was not a formalist. And I, for example, Mr. Dorson, ha Dorson has this great Business about how Friendly got involved with his social with his social security litigant who was trying to get disability benefits, and Friendly became really interested in this case. And I think I'm not sure I have the details right. Dorson can straighten us out, but I think he actually got a a, a doctor for this fellow. This is while the litigation is going on, is coming back to him, and so on. So there's a kind of um, freewheeling character to Judge Friendly that was completely new to me and made him, you know, a lot more vivid and living. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Posner. Uh, I want to set the scene a little bit. Um, Professor Kokolat, I'm going to ask you to set the scene a little bit. You say that um, Henry Friendly graduated from Harvard Law School, class of 1927. So in 1927, Roscoe Pound was the dean of Harvard Law School, and Abbott Lawrence Lowell was uh, the president of the university. He was an HLS grad himself. What was it like, socially and culturally, to be at Harvard Law School uh, in those days? Well, speaking to all the students here, uh, you, you are lucky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. a Harvard Law School was a really rough place when Friendly was here. Um, to start with, the school was about the size that it is now. It had 1,500 students when he graduated. It had only 20 
professors and six assistant professors. That is a student-faculty ratio of one to 60. Uh, and uh, you'd be very lucky if you were a student to know any of the faculty. There were so few. And all the classes were big. There were no small classrooms at all. But secondly, uh, the school was in, in terrible shape, both financially and physically. Um, they uh, started to build Langdell Hall in 1907 because Austin Hall was hopelessly overcrowded. Um, they ran out of money. Uh, they stopped the construction halfway through. Uh, when uh, uh, Friendly was here, the, it, it, they didn't start again until 1928. Uh, so uh, that school of 1,500 students was being accommodated in a building and a half that had been designed for 700 students. Everything was jammed. You had to wait in line practically to sit down uh, in the library. Uh, the admissions process was uh, bizarre. Uh, they essentially admitted 650, 700 students into the first year class, and they flunked in, in Friendly's year, they flunked 37% uh, of the first year students out. So the, the way they had, had selectivity was to let anyone in who had a diploma from a college on a list they kept and then flunk out one out of three. Uh, this created a stressful environment. <laughs> very, very stressful. Now, on top of all of this, um, uh, Friendly was self-identified as Jewish. Uh, and uh, now he d his, his the wonderful, this wonderful book by David Dorson points out is personal uh, beliefs were not devout, uh, but that uh, didn't make any difference in the environment in which he entered. We know for a fact now because of the unsealing of documents that there was a quota against Jews. So uh, only about 5% of the class was going to be Jewish. And that was the only selectivity the school had. And, and not surprisingly, many of the Jewish students were among the best students. Uh, but it was a harsh environment. And to give you just one example of what it meant to be Jewish uh, at the school when Friendly was here, uh, recently unsealed correspondence between Abbott Lawrence Lowell, uh, who was a bigot, uh, and Roscoe Pound. Lowell asked it, Pound for the names of all the Jewish students at the school. That would have included Friendly. Uh, and Pound wrote back and said, why? Why do you want them? And he said, because I'm going to do a Jewish experiment. I'm going to do an experiment that shows that the Jewish students are more likely to be dishonest intellectually than the Caucasian students. And Pound, to his everlasting credit, refused to pro provide the list, but for the wrong reasons. He said he, he couldn't tell who was Jewish and who wasn't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, and this anti-Semitism, as, as, as Dorson's book points out powerfully, was uh, just a fact of life, not just within the school, uh, but outside the school uh, as well. Now, against this background of tremendous stress, uh, and by the way, there were uh, numerous suicides at this time uh, among the students, um, not only did Friendly succeed, but he succeeded in a way that is almost beyond belief. Uh, I know that a lot of you uh, maybe never received an A minus in law school uh, because you've only gotten A's. Uh, <laughs> you could say honestly that Friendly never got an A. He only got uh, A pluses uh, because the average, uh, his average was 86. Uh, a straight A was 75. Uh, and A plus for a SUMA was 80. He had an average that exceeded an A plus average uh, as, as, you know, exceeded summa cum laude by six points. It was an astonishing average. Uh, against the backdrop I've just described, no seats in the library, anti-Semitism, uh, a very stressful environment, uh, he succeeded in a way which was simply uh, unbelievable. I mean, we, you can argue about who had the highest record. Brandeis is the, is the other candidate in the history of the school, but Friendly is certainly uh, one of the contenders. <laughs> And let me just add one last thing. Against all this background, against all the uh, strife he had, uh, he had a friend, Felix Frankfurter, who really helped him. Um, and he never, never uh, forgot what Harvard Law School did for him. Uh, and uh, in 1943, when the school was in terrible shape because of the war, and Landis wasn't here physically, uh, he was called on by President Conant to help the school recruit faculty. He did it. When he died so tragically, 
he only left one bequest to a charitable organization, and that was to Harvard Law School. I think it's particularly nice that Carol Steiker is in the Henry Friendly Chair against the devotion of this man uh, to the school. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, I forgot to say, like, what's my connection to Henry Friendly? <laughs> and my connection is, is that I inherited the Henry J. Friendly Chair of Law from my beloved colleague, uh, Bill Stunts, who died uh, almost two years ago. And so now I sit as the Henry J. Friendly Professor. And I, I can share with you a joke that I often had with Bill, who was one of the sweetest guys uh, alive. I used to say he was a lot more friendly than Friendly was. Um, because, and I'm going to turn to that. Friendly as a, as a boss. You know, what was Friendly like to work for as a boss um, and to, as, to appear uh, before as a litigant? Um, and some of the stories, you know, are incredibly inspiring, and some are rather, shall we say, intimidating. So, Professor Rakoff, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to uh, be a law clerk to Judge Friendly? Uh, well, intimidating is certainly fair. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would say uh, old-fashioned would be, would be more the way I, I, I would put it. He was a very old-fashioned boss. He his basic idea was that you were there to work. And his basic proposition was, show me you're good. Hey, if you show me you're good, maybe somewhere down the line we'll get uh, friendly to each other. But basically the proposition was you were there to show him that, to do the work and to show him that you, that you were good at it. And what counterbalanced that, what, what made that not just sort of feeling like you were always uh, under the gun, uh, because you were trying to show that you were good to someone who was better at it than you were, uh, was that he fought fair. Uh, when, when he had discussions uh, on uh, points of what does a precedent show or how should we put something in an opinion or how should we get rid of this other Second Circuit opinion which has got to be gotten rid of because we weren't going to follow it, uh, uh, it was a, the, the, the only question on the table was what, what will make the best product? What will make the best law? What will make the best opinion? Uh, and if what you presented was better than what he had written, he had absolutely no hesitation in scrapping what he had, had done. He, he didn't have any sort of pridefulness that, that well, you're not going to, you know, you're going to tell me what to do. He was quite happy if you were, if you could beat him at an argument to be beaten at it. An army. So that seemed to me like the counterbalance that made it fair to work for somebody whose basic attitude was you were there to do good work, and that was the basic proposition. Now, you were uh, more social with him than I was in the long run, so I don't know whether you had a different impression. Judge Medine. Uh, against a, a suggestion of a certain grimness of outlook and manner in, in Judge Friendly, in the book, and, and Dick, to some extent, averted to it. it. It ought to be appreciated that the style in that period among people of his generation was very much a, a hard work, good work, and if you fail, it's your fault. But it was not peculiar to Judge Friendly. <coughs> it was shared among others by his contemporaries for whom I worked, Justice Harlan and Hugh Cox, his founding partner but it was also shared by the professors in the Harvard Law School. And it was a style that persisted right up to the period when Pierre and I were in the law school, at least for the older first year professors. So in many ways, it was not a reflection of his own character. It was the way business was done in a generation that had come of age just before and during the Depression, who'd seen hard times, and who had a different ethos and a rather uncongratulatory style. So the paper chase idea was <laughs> not so, uh, so, so far afield. Yes, Judge Laval. I'd like a, a, a modest disagreement with Mike. <laughs> I agree with everything Mike said, except that I think that, there, that, that Judge Friendly uh, was, did have, in addition to reflecting his own times, uh, a toughness and a, an unwillingness to um, to accept the product 
of people less intelligent than himself, which was everyone, uh, and, others. And, and there were famous stories that circulated about him, such as that uh, this was a story that emanated from the firm Cleary Gottlieb, where I later was a, was a partner for a short time, uh, that um, he had written a, a um, having received a memorandum from one of the uh, associates, he wrote in the margin, your memorandum has much in it that is good and much in it that is new. Unfortunately, what is new, what, what, is, what is good is not new, and what is new is not good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think uh, a large number of his clerks, including myself, were terrified. <laughs> Judge Laval, can you describe a little bit, uh, you know, one thing that uh, Professor Rakoff's comment makes clear is Judge Friendly, unlike uh, many judges, but I think like some of the judges here today, wrote his opinions, um, wrote them uh, longhand. Can you describe a little bit the process of Judge Friendly producing uh, a draft of an opinion? This is something amazing. The general public, the general law public, knows the wonderful quality of Judge Friendly's opinions. Uh, but of course, some of them people disagree with. Some of them think uh, another result would have been better. What is not generally known, except by those of us as law clerks who, who worked intimately in that chambers and saw how these opinions were produced, is, the, is, the, is this amazing process which I will describe. First of all, Judge Friendly had all of law in his head. Now, all of law was not at that time what all of law is today, because I'm talking about a period that preceded the mushrooming of, of thousand page statutes out of Congress. Uh, all of law was sort of closer to the common law at the time that, that, that we clerked in the, in the early 60s. But he had it all in his head. And not only was it all in his head, but it was all in his head with a with an extraordinary understanding of the interrelationships between all the different doc doctrines and how they function together as organic, biological, mutually sustaining uh, forces. It, it, it was amazing. Now, this, the brain power behind this was, was simply astonishing, and, and, and it was revealed by the process you asked me to describe uh, by which he would produce his opinions. He would sit down at a writing table surrounded by the briefs and appendices. And he had read those briefs and appendices uh, maybe for a stack this big, uh, it would have taken him an hour to read through them and he'd know everything that was in them. And he would sit down with a, a pad of lined paper like this um, and he would start writing and he would write from the very left edge of the paper to the very right edge of the paper, single spacing, so that there was zero space on the paper for changing anything. <laughs> and he would write at approximately the speed that he would be writing if he was copying from a previously prepared text. And the fact is, he was copying from a previously prepared text, because that text was from the time that he finished his, his, his mental preparation for the case, that, that text was all written out in his brain. He knew exactly the progression of the arguments that he would deal with. He would, he would know every, everything he would say. And he would simply sit there and, and, and write it, just write it as if he, at the speed at which he were copying. And when he wanted, when there was a, a, an occasion for a string cite, he would simply get up, walk over to the shelf of numbered volumes, and pluck a volume. He knew which one he wanted, because he had squirreled away in that volume a string sight on that point, and he knew where to find it. <laughs> when he wanted, as he, as he frequently did, a, a quote from Learned Hand, he would walk over, Similarly, pluck the volume, knowing what volume it was in. Uh, sometimes he needed to look in the index to find the page, just as often he didn't. He'd take it and copy the string site, the hand quote, whatever it is, into the opinion. Now, I should add that as to the hand quotes, he didn't really need to get up at all, because he could have just written them out of his brain where he knew them. Uh, and there might have been a comma to add or subtract or something. That was the kind of work that most of the work of his law clerks with little 
little things like that. He didn't need law clerks. But it was simply <laughs> astonishing. <laughs> it was astonishing to witness this process, the, now, the intellectual power that it represented. Now, I don't know if any of the friendly law clerks in the room are the source of the story, but I recall from reading Mr. Dorson's book that he would write with a fountain pen, and that when it was empty, he would pick up a new pen and hold out the empty pen, and the clerks would have to come in and fill the empty pen while he was writing with his other hand. Does, does anyone remember this particular? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's one of those legendary um, Henry Friendly stories that there's makes a, it. There's a footnote to that. What's the footnote? I don't remember. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was already ballpoints by the time I was yeah. clerking for him, but I remember coming in and replacing the ballpoint. The ball that's, that's, that's a little footnote. easier. <laughs> um, Judge Newman, uh, you sat with Judge Friendly, but before you did, you appeared before him as a litigant. Are there any uh, memorable oral argument stories you can share from the other side of the, of the bench? Well, two or three things occur to me. Uh, the word intimidating has been used. I think when you appeared before him, the reputation was intimidating, but the man was not. Um, I appeared several times as U.S. attorney in front of him, um, defending, uh, usually defending criminal convictions. Uh, he, he was somewhat austere, but he was not tough on lawyers, at least not, I, David reports some experiences of, of uh, toughness, uh, certainly not abuse, I don't think, although you have a couple that are even border on that. But um, I, I, fortunately, I did not experience that. But as you approached him, certainly the first time, the, the reputation was so overwhelming, you were scared to death. Um, so let me just share two or three uh, uh, vignettes of that time. First, one was a jest, and he was not one to jest frequently, but um, if at all. But, uh, <laughs> One day I had the first case of a calendar that was uh, all criminal cases, and so the room was loaded with uh, assistant U.S. attorneys from the southern and eastern districts. And I got up to, to uh, first, the first one, and after the appellant argued, I argued for the government. And I had just barely started, and he interrupted me, and he said, by the way, who argued this case, who tried this case for the government? Of course, he knew perfectly well had he'd read everything. <laughs> But he asked the question anyway uh, for what was going to come. I said, I did, Your Honor. Oh, he said with mock surprise, a U.S. attorney who tries his own cases. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I enjoyed that. Uh, then there was the time when, um, after arguing a case, I went back uh, and a week later got a call from the Solicitor General's office on a case that had two, two grounds by which a conviction could be affirmed. Solicitor General called and said, we need to tell you that we've confessed error in the Seventh Circuit case, which is the same kind of case you have. We've confessed error, and so you need to tell the court. And I said to the Assistant Solicitor General, I said, well, did your case have that second ground in it? And there was a long silence, and I heard him call to his uh, desk mate across the way, did we have that other thing in it? And the thing came back sort of apparently, yes. And I said, so you didn't need to confess error, did you? And he said, no, I guess not. He said, but you better call the Second Circuit anyway. I said, of course I have to. So I picked up the phone. I, I, I didn't, for all I knew, the, the opinion could come down instantly. I didn't have time to write a memo and see the court embarrassed with an opinion after a confession of error. So perhaps uh, violating some ex parte rules, I just picked up the phone and called Judge Friendly. And I explained to him that the, the Solicitor General had confessed error in the Seventh Circuit case. And I waited to see what the reaction was. He said, well, you're not going to throw in the towel in this one, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so relieved with that, I said, Judge, my theory is we have two towels, and I'm only throwing in one of them. <laughs> and he, he said, well, get me a memo right away, which I did, and he affirmed on the other ground. <laughs> I was very happy to see. More a comment, I guess, on the Solicitor General than, than, than Judge Friendly, but maybe perhaps both. <laughs> And, and then one of my favorites was uh, the best put down I ever got from anybody, and I cherish it. Uh, you know, when you go to argue in any case, you, you give a lot of thought to that first thing you're going to say, the first sentence, because in many courts you don't get to say the second sentence, so you want to try very hard to get that first sentence out. So this was a case where a district judge had enjoined the lawyers 
from interrogating jurors after the verdict. And I was defending the injunction. So I thought a lot about how to say it, and I got up and I said, may it please the court, this appeal presents this court with a clear opportunity to set forth the standards on interrogation, post-trial interrogation of jurors by lawyers. Judge Friendly looked down and he said, I take it that's an opportunity we are free to decline. <laughs> 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 those are my favorites. <laughs> uh, those are great. Um, Judge Friendly uh, was clearly enormously revered by his fellow judges, um, by the legal uh, community. Um, in fact, I just was told a story by Professor Richard Lazarus, who's here today, that when he was in the SG's office, the word was, if you had a, a friendly dissent, you could say in an SG brief that the weight of authority was on your <laughs> um, So clearly, uh, friendly was incredibly revered. And yet, Judge Posner, I want to direct this question to you. Uh, uh, in, a, in a review of uh, Mr. Dorson's book, uh, my colleague Adrian Vermeule, your, your former law clerk, um, who couldn't be here today, but he, he wrote a review of, of uh, this uh, terrific book where he opines that he thinks uh, Friendly uh, is not as well known today and is likely to be less well known in the future relative to other judges like Learned Hand or Benjamin Cardozo uh, because of the kind of judge that Friendly was, a, a man of uh, local practical wisdom rather than overarching uh, exportable theories. Um, what do you think of that as a, as a prediction about uh, Friendly's future reputation? Has the Friendly bubble burst, is my question. Yes, well actually, you know, uh, Judge Lavelle wrote um, a, a piece recently in which he said that, um, that a quarter century after Judge Friendly's death, he has slid into obscurity. So, um, that's a conclusion similar to Professor Vermeule's, although the the um, the, the grounds are. I'm not actually be interested in what I, I wasn't clear, Pierre, what what your reason was. But what Vermeule says is that I'm quoting from his review: the reputations of judges such as Friendly generally have a shorter half life than the reputations of judges who offer fertile theoretical ideas that can be distilled into formulas, theorems, and pithy, pithy aphorisms. Well, I, I, I'm not, I, would, I don't think I'd say it that way. What, what I would say is that, um, that the, pro the problem for Judge Friendly, in terms of, you know, reputation, um, he's, He's, he wasn't a colorful writer. His opinions are very dense. And um, he obviously didn't do a lot of self-editing. So they're dense. They have a lot of details which could have been left out. They have very long sentences. So they're not really fun to read. And the, the problem with that is that over a period of years, actually not very many years, um, what a judge says is going to be repeated by other judges. Or in the case of Judge Friendly, partly because of his really influential extrajudicial writings, the Supreme Court adopted a lot of his ideas. So when a later court adopts a view, it's the later court that's likely to be cited for that view. And the only thing that will keep the, the older judges being cited is if they're they have these pithy aphorisms, right? So Hand and Cardozo and Holmes and Robert Jackson, for example, they're just very colorful, vivid writers. And they write very simply, and they write in a way that lay people can understand. And so um, you keep going back to them for the best statement of a rule, even though the rule had been repeated countless times since. But with Judge Friendly, the, the way in which he expresses himself is, is not necessarily you know, vivid, colorful, and so on. 
So his ideas enter into the law, have a big influence, are repeated in later cases, and then it's the later cases that get cited and repeated. Um, that's not a criticism of Judge Friendly, but I think it explains why um, why he, he 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 doesn't have the 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 recognition you could say that some judges who are anterior to him in time, you know, like Holmes obviously and Han and Cardozo continue to be um, quoted a lot a lot more. Judge Laval, do you want to comment on this question of Friendly's yes, I, reputation? I'd, I'd like to say a few things. Um, a lot of what Vermeule says in his review is accurate, uh, but I think it's uh, I think it underappreciates uh, the um, the the fertile resourcefulness and and idea laden quotient of of Judge Friendly. Judge Friendly was not the sort of judge who was out to use the writing of opinions to reform society. Um, uh, that is certainly true, uh, and that is uh, he, he was a he was a, um, a, a a judge who who regarded it as his um, duty to decide the cases and to to decide it within the scope of the law. Uh, uh, the law sometimes need needed correcting. That is to say, wrong decisions, badly made prior decisions, needed correcting. But he was not out to reform society. Uh, Dick is absolutely correct um, in talking about um, uh, his rejection of, um, of pithy aph aphorisms that were easily quoted. And I'd like to give a little example of that. He was a judge who never succumbed to the temptation that many judges do resort to, to use uh, rhetorical devices to make uh, to make their conclusion seem more persuasive and seem more compelling than it really is. Judge Friendly always uh, treated the issue in all of its full complexity and with a, an incredibly keen, incisive uh, uh, understanding of all of those complexities. And I'm going to give you an example of the non-quotability of Henry Friendly. <laughs> uh, um, uh, this is from an opinion that actually was in, was in my year, the Kinsman Transit case about the flooding of the Buffalo River and all the incredible harm that took place uh, uh, from that. And he says, we see no reason why an actor engaging in conduct which entails a large risk of small damage and a small risk of other and greater damage of the same general sort from the same forces and to the same class of persons should be relieved of responsibility for the latter simply because the chance of its occurrence if viewed alone may not have been large enough to require the exercise of care. By hypothesis, the risk of the lesser harm was sufficient to render his disregard of it actionable. The existence of a less likely additional risk that the very forces against whose action he was required to guard would produce the other and greater damage than could have been reasonably anticipated should inculpate him further rather than limit his liability. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, one more thing I want to add, um, which is uh, I think that Vermeule uh, under, underestimates, underappreciates uh, the extent to which creative ideas play a role in Friendly's jurisprudence. The, the law, the common law process in which, in which opinions cite one another and each opinion is precedent for a subsequent opinion, is in a way constantly deteriorating as judges who are lazier and less intelligent and less knowledgeable and understanding than Judge Friendly, which includes all of us, as I've said, take, take sentences from prior opinions which were used for some particular, very particular purpose in that prior brain. They take the sentence like a brittle piece of wood, stick it into the new opinion as if it satisfactorily answered the questions in the new opinion, and they don't necessarily. And 
the, and, and the law in that fashion is kind of constantly deteriorating, except when a judge like Judge Friendly, who has this extraordinary understanding of how it all fits together and how it works like a, like a living, functioning biological entity and what the limits are, the proper limits. Are. He was constantly, constantly um, uh, explaining doctrine explaining the function that some doctrine served in the law in a manner that was extraordinarily impressive and extraordinarily helpful to, um, to the, the development of law. And that's why his opinions are, are, were at the time so repeatedly uh, quoted until, as, uh, as Dick Posner was, was saying, the, uh, the blue book function of, of citing the most recent opinions sort of forced them off the page. Judge Boudin. Uh, this might be a useful uh, time in talking about his influence to recall his uh, second life on the bench, which was as a writer of uh, quite extraordinary uh, law review pieces. Because in some ways, um, the check on his influence is that most of the Second Circuit's work would be matters that are no longer of, of, of general significance, complicated transactions, particular criminal proceedings. And that, that is the stuff of most Court of Appeals opinions, where the, 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 the lasting impression on the law is likely to be in the constitutional area. And he did not have the last word. Indeed, he didn't that often get major constitutional cases, because no Court of Appeals uh, gets them. But he embarked on a career, a simultaneous career, of writing when he got on the bench. He did very little academic writing in practice, uh, uh, holding down two jobs. One is general counsel of Pan Am, and the other is a head of the Cleary Gottlieb firm simultaneously. Um, but when he began to write, it was like a well opening up and out poured one article after another, often famous lectures. And to conclude about, saying something about his influence. My own impression in, in, in reading back over what he had done in, in doing some writing um, and being overwhelmed by what I hadn't appreciated as a law clerk uh, is that his major contributions may well be linked importantly to the articles, which were less complicated and less uh, uh, obscure in their writing and often did have flourishes in them. One uh, obvious is an uh, example is in the field of federal common law, where his Cardozo lecture on Erie was of, of such power and so particular in framing a solution for federal common law uh, that it, a great deal of it was absorbed in subsequent Supreme Court opinions, for which he gets no credit. But he really did start that ball rolling uh, fast. And in the other obvious example is his writings, particularly two critical articles about uh, Warren Court uh, criminal law, um, where I've <laughs> it's pretty clear to me that a good deal of what has happened in the last uh, uh, um, quarter century is a reflection of just what he was writing about in habeas corpus and procedural rights in criminal cases. And there, it does seem to me he's had a great influence. And given John Roberts' admiration, the influence is not over. Yes, you can see the influence I just told my class as we're studying ha the law of ha federal habeas corpus, his article, famous article on the, uh, is innocence irrelevant to federal habeas corpus? Just yesterday in the New York Times on the front page was an article by Adam Liptak about a case before the court right now about whether innocence is, should play a role in equitably tolling um, uh, habeas claims under the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, EDPA of 1996. So you could see uh, Judge Friendly's influence even on the New York Times as of yesterday. Uh, and certainly in the court's habeas jurisprudence and the role that innocence plays uh, in that. Um, Judge Posner, uh, we we, uh, Judge Boudin talks about sort of a second life. You know, Judge Friendly had a, a life as a court of appeals judge and as a writer of um, 
influential law review articles. He never had that third life, though he might have, uh, ha uh, of appointment to the US Supreme Court. And I wonder what kind of Supreme Court justice you think he would have made or what kind of influence he might have had on the Supreme Court had he been appointed, uh, say, by Nixon instead of someone like Lewis Powell to the, to the court? Um, well, he wouldn't have had to write those articles that, uh, <laughs> that my Boudin mentioned because he, he would have been in a position to There's write no, the opinions no, that narrowed the Warren Court's um, extravagant habeas corpus <laughs> jurisprudence. Um, but I, I think he would have, I think he would have um, had, a, had a great effect on the Supreme Court. I think for one thing, he, he, would, have, he would have been a real example to the other justices um, he would have shamed them <laughs> into doing more of their own work, you know, not relying so heavily on law clerks. Um, because, because um, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but oh, do. <clears throat> the Supreme Court has the Supreme Court has not had really distinctive uh, members for for quite a long time, I think. <laughs> and usually in the past, there was one or two, you know, be Holmes, Holmes and Brandeis, Robert Jackson, Frankfurter at his best, not always at his best, but sometimes at his best. he was at his best. Um, and I think it's important for any court to have at least one or two people who are who are not just competent lawyers, but have some other dimension to them. And, and Friendly would, would have added that. And I, as I say, I think, I think that would have had an influence on, on the other people. And it would also have influenced subsequent appointments. Because I think if he'd been on the court, people would have realized, you know, having a really brilliant person on the Supreme Court is an asset, <laughs> right? That you shouldn't have all the appointments based on, you know, diversity and politics and, and cronyism and all that. You said have one or two slots for people who are just there on merit, not because they're colorful, charming, connected, you know, or anything like that. So I think it was a, it was a big loss. I, I gather from the biography that some consideration was given in the administration to appointing a friendly back in the early... Uh, 70s, but it, 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 it didn't work. So, so I, I think that that has been, that was a was a big was a big loss. Judge Newman, I was I, I was going to ask you anyway, oh, but I'll let turn, you. I, yes, I want to just follow up on the reputation issue for one or two thoughts. First of all, I think there's a numerical aspect to it. Um, Hand was an appellate judge when the appellate bench was rather small. By the time Friendly hit his stride on the Second Circuit, the appellate bench nationally was much larger. Um, I suspect if Friendly had been a judge in the Hand era and Hand had been a judge in the Friendly era, <laughs> the, the Friendly reputation would have far surpassed Hand's. Uh, so that's just one thing. I think the numbers matter. Um, I have no idea what Friendly's reputation will be uh, 20, 50, 100 years from now. but. For those of us who are working, at least in the inferior courts of our country now, the thing about Henry Friendly's work is, it, it, it is twofold. One is substance. There isn't a field of law that we deal, uh, deal with in which he hasn't molded it in a significant way. He's written the key opinions on about, what, 20 fields, I think David uh, identifies them. It's not just that they're the opinions we cite, they're so good. They sometimes push the law a little, sometimes do other things, explain the law, <coughs> harmonize disparate parts of the law, uh, shape the law, do a lot of things, but they have an influence on the substance of at least 20 fields, how long that'll last, I don't know. But it's certainly, I'm gonna think it's there as long as I'm a judge because they are the leading opinions. And the second dimension, apart from substance, is craft. Now, 
putting aside the passage that Pierre favored us with, <laughs> uh, and recognizing that he was not given to the, the colorful phrase, the aphorism. There is nonetheless a craftsmanship about his work that every appellate judge ought to pay attention to. Indeed, I think if you be, the day you become an appellate judge, the first thing you ought to do is read about 20 Henry Friendly opinions in different fields. And just appreciate what the man is doing when he takes up that either the old pen or the ballpoint pen. He's, he's putting together an opinion that is, is an exemplar. It, 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 it does so much for the field of law he's, he's working on. It's straightforward. There are some long sentences. They could have used a few more periods. I don't care about that. They flow. Faulkner wrote long sentences, too, and he got the Nobel Prize. So I don't think you should knock him on long sentences, as some do. Um, but there's a craft there. There's a, a, a comprehending approach to not only his problem, but three or four related problems. And part of his brilliance was understanding, as Pierre says, how they fit together and what not to say to mess things up. I often say to my law clerks, the business we're in is damage control. <laughs> that we're writing about things, we may know a little bit about the precise thing, but we don't know very much about the other things. Henry Friendly knew about all the other things. And so when he put together an opinion, he was very careful to be helpful on what he was dealing with and never harmful, by my lights at least, mm -hmm. on the other fields that he was touching. Well, that's a craftsmanship that, that nobody of his era did. And he not only did it, but he did it brilliantly almost all the time. Can you say a word or two, Judge Newman, about what it was like to sit on a panel with Judge Friendly? Oh, sure. Uh, well, the, the, the most dominant thing one recalls is what Pierre mentioned, the voting memos. Uh, in, the, in that era, the court, the panel of three, did not meet after the oral argument, but went back to chambers and prepared a voting memo. And we were quite religious about it in that we would not read the incoming memo that afternoon or the next afternoon until we sent out our own. And it was the deliberative process at its best. We don't do it now, and we're the poor for, for not doing it. But it was terrific. Two memos came in, and you had your own. Then we met as a conference and had the three not, not just the vote, not just the outcome, but the reasons. Now, for us mortals, it was a two or three page memo. Uh, for Judge Friendly, it would be 10, 17 pages. It was a draft opinion, and it often was the draft opinion. <laughs> and it was just astonishing to, to get that at either four o'clock that afternoon or, or the following morning to see this huge opinion arrive. I mean, it was just inspiring. To, to know that you were working with somebody who could produce something like that. Now, we've lost that. Now, now we meet, we talk briefly, and the writer has pretty much the franchise, how to shape the opinion. Uh, we've lost a lot from the days when we had the, the voting memos and when Henry was showing us how to do voting memos. Um, to sit with him was always a joy. I mean, he asked the right questions. Uh, he... Uh, uh, he, 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 would, he, he, always, he always knew what he was about, even I, and, and, and who was going to do what. I marveled as a very young judge. We, on one, one day we, we had this terrible environmental case. It was just terribly complicated, these environmental regulations that run to pages and they're dense as can be. And we're just walking up the two steps of the robing room into the uh, courtroom. Uh, he was there and uh, Judge Lombard, I think, was presiding. And Judge Friendly turned to Lombard and then turned to me and he says to Lombard, guess we know who's going to write this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. Uh, and, and another recollection I have, which, which tells you a side of him that, that may not be widely known. He knew what he knew and he knew what he didn't know. Um, we heard a case, an appeal involving how a trial judge should handle notes from jurors, and there had been hardly anything written about the issue of notes. What do you do? What does the district judge do? What do you do with the lawyers? What do you do with the jury? 
and the lawyers would have very little help in the case. And when we talked about that case, we had no discussion at all other than this. Judge Friendly turned to me, he said, he said, you write this. He said, you've dealt with this problem. You know something about it, you write it. And, and of course I was floored because I figured, I mean, he knows everything, so why, <laughs> why, 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 why is he turning? But he didn't know about that. He had not handled jury notes, I guess. And so he just said, he's a district judge who's just come on our court, so you write it. Uh, that, that, that's, that, that's something a lot of other judges wouldn't have done. They just say, well, I know how to do this, and I'll, and I'll do it. Great. I'm going to ask a few more questions, and then I'm going to throw open this uh, wonderful panel to the audience so, uh, to give you all a chance to ask your questions. Judge Boudin, I want to ask you, we've heard a lot of wonderful things about Judge Friendly. Did he have any flaws? <laughs> um, the, the two, which uh, seem to be pretty minor, but um, worth mentioning, uh, uh, are these. Uh, he, he was uh, perhaps a tough on law clerks, uh, or, or at least those who hadn't been thoroughly exposed to counterpart experiences in the first year at Harvard Law School, to which it was then a more familiar style. Uh, and I think this may have cost him uh, a bit of help because in some, in some situations, people could be frightened into not, uh, into not making suggestions. And although he, he was a judge whose clerks all thought he could have done the job without the slightest help from them, his own view seems to have been different. Partly, it was having someone to talk to. Uh, it was a fairly lonely, Place. The judges did not, at least in my period, spend a lot of time with each other. Uh, the job's a lonely one anyways. And this was the one person in my time in Pierre, shortly after two people, uh, with whom he can carry on these conversations. And it seemed to me that it mattered to him. He may not have um, appreciated how, um, how, how people would hesitate to give their views if they were sufficiently frightened. And as for the, uh, the style, uh, dense is exactly the right word. In some ways, trying to read one of the opinions is like unwrapping an extremely complicated puzzle of some kind. It's a, a stunning performance. Uh, it's, it's condensed, it's powerful, it's intricate. And it probably cost uh, him some readership, even though to other people, the fun of working it out and going slowly through it was was part part of the pleasure. But he was not an entirely dry writer. There are a reasonable number of rather clever uh, uh, um, constructions. There's a famous one, I think, about uh, uh, the arising under clause in which he cites uh, Holmes's formula and then says it's come to be realized over time that the formula, although intended for exclusion, is really more useful simply to identify what is included. It was a very nice way of handling a point in which he was going to disagree with Holmes. And he was, he was pretty good at um, lighting things up a little bit. But it was fairly heavy duty, and it may have uh, there are phrases, though. I mean, his comment on the Alien Tort Act yes. is, a, is a lovely one. Yes. Here's this statute from, what is it here, 1795? Something like that, you know. Is that 1789. 80, 89? Oh, the first judicial, what is it? 89? So he has a, uh, a case under this ancient statute, and he says of it, this statute is a legal Lohengrin. Yeah. No <laughs> one knows whence it came. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the one friendly opinion I remember learning in law school is what is chicken? Um, so, um, <laughs> Professor Rakoff, do you teach anything? Uh, do you teach yeah, what the, is a chicken? Uh, um, free aliment, as I recall? Or, or what, what of Judge Friendly's work? The, 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 the question is what is chicken? The question is what is chicken? chicken. That, that I think many people in this room will have, will have read that, that case. Uh, uh, and uh, it is true that a lot of his uh, stuff uh, Less than should appears in case books. I think that's true. I think uh, 
though that um, to some extent it's our fault and not his fault uh, in, in the following sense. He, he was not a theorist. He uh, um, did not believe in, he was not a social scientist looking at the law from an outside point of view or try, someone who thought that you should have a grand theory. So, for example, on the question, if you took statutory construction, the kind of thing that we talk about in leg reg, uh, he was not someone who would say you ought to be a textualist. And he's not someone who would say you ought to be a purp purposivist. He's someone who would say, in some situations, given who's how the statute was written, given who the likely users of the statute are, you ought to be a textualist. And in other cases, uh, it would make more sense to be a purposivist. And he would be much more contextual about that choice rather than trying to design a grand theory one way, one way or the other. Now, uh, 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 Professor Vermeule is probably right that that hurts his reputation <coughs> in the academy now because the way we teach leg reg is you ought to take a stand on that uh, question one way or the other uh, and kind of keep pursuing one side of it or the, or the other. Uh, but um, the uh, older professors, I don't mean me, although I am <laughs> one, but I mean professors of, an, of another era, the professors who judged Cardozo a great judge were people who thought that uh, what Judge Newman referred to as craft or what um, Carl Llewellyn referred to as situation sense, this, this, this attempt to look at all sides of something and decide in a smaller con context what was the best approach for this case, they prized that. That was uh, Cardozo's reputation was built in part on being the exemplar of that way of thinking about it. The friendly opinions would stand up very well if we were judging them by that point of view. So it's to some extent the fact that the academy has now come more to prize the, uh, the uh, monotextured uh, theoretical argument as opposed to the multi-stranded uh, co contextual argument that has, I think, affected the uh, reputation question. Mr. Dorsen? Yeah, one of the things that I gradually sort of got into my conscience as I was writing the book and the thought about since is that Judge Friendly would approach things from different points of view, purposivist, textualist and everything else that could uh, help his uh, reach a decision. But I concluded that to a great extent, he picked the approach that would lead to the result he wanted. That he, and it was not, a, you know, it's not a, uh, an ideological thing, it was, he felt in many situations that a certain result, legal result was desirable from the standpoint of the development of the law. And I can't say how his mind worked, but he would say he would get there by choosing the most suitable theoretical framework that would get him to the desired result. And in the book, I, I did not press this, partly because it was impossible to do in, in the context of a biography, and partly because my thinking on this kept evolving. But you will see many decisions where he, I point out, he was, you know, he would depart from the briefs radically from what was uh, the, the parties presented, and I started looking at those as I was finishing the book from the standpoint. Well, here he's an activist. Here he's a, you know, very much bound by precedent. Here he's a purposivist. Here, in a case of the Selena, where which was a Sixth Amendment case, he was an originalist, and I think. He was attempting to mold the law in the way that the panel has suggested, <coughs> but, you know, intelligently, brilliantly, uh, co comprehensively, but to reach the result he needed to mold the law, he would pick and choose among the various approaches that would let him do that. Judge Laval? I don't think I agree with that. Um, uh, I think as Todd was saying, um, 
Friendly's, Friendly's understanding of, of law was profound beyond what most people's are. And the, and the, the, um, the phrases that, that dominate law, well, t t let's start with, a, with, with, with things like the interpretation of statutes. Um, uh, and as Todd was saying, uh, a lot of the academic discourse is, are you a textualist? Are you an originalist? Are you a purposivist? And um, friendly, and it seems to me with eminent good sense, and, and it seems to me uncontrovertibly, would regard that as sort of preposterous because different types of statutes call for different kinds of interpretation. Now, if you're a textualist and you consider a statute that says combinations in restraint of trade are illegal, what are you gonna do with your textualism in analyzing and coming to the conclusions of the questions that, that are presented to the court? Friendly said to me during my clerkship that, that his view was uh, with respect to income tax statutes, that income tax statutes uh, were uh, particularly appropriate for a textualist approach because the statutes are very, very complex, they're very detailed, they're revisited by Congress with frequently, frequency, they are so complicated that no judge can, can come close to understanding uh, uh, how, the, how the whole thing operates together. Um, uh, and if Congress doesn't like it, uh, they can fix it. And in, in, so uh, I, I don't think that it's fair to say that Friendly, uh, it, it would take, I'm sure that he departed from the textualism with respect to tax statutes in, in a small number of instances when there was a particularly compelling case to do so. But he had, he had theory and logic and reason behind the notion that you can't just be a textualist across the board or a purposivist or a, or a, an originalist a, across the board. Uh, I doubt that he was ever an originalist. If by originalist you mean that you uh, that that you um, uh, 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 disallow any subsequent development to to have any influence on your thinking, other than what was was meant at the outset. Now, another example is his uh, his article on on um, on discretion, in which. He takes a phrase, uh, there are thousands of judicial opinions that say district judges are reviewed on certain questions for abuse of discretion. And he recognized that that one phrase used for hundreds of different kinds of circumstances doesn't mean the same thing every time it's used, that the, the, the degree of discretion uh, varies from case to, from, from, not from case to case, but from issue from legal issue to legal issue for very good reasons. There are, there are questions where a judge has discretion, but that would be a very narrow discretion. There are other types of questions where the district judge has practically the whole field to walk over and he will rarely be touched on, on appeal. And I don't think it's correct to say that Friendly was just picking and choosing which he would apply because of the result he wanted to reach in that case. I think he was picking and choosing because of the result that makes be best sense with respect to that particular slice of the doctrine of the meaning of discretion. Well, um, a moment of rebuttal, and then I have a final question for Judge Posner. Okay, I, I don't think we're that far apart, but uh, uh, because I think, well, let me just say in, in response to Ju uh, Judge Laval's comment about income tax, which I discussed in the book, Yes, he was a, 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 often a, a textualist. However, he reached back for the absurdity doctrine and used that to cancel out the statutory language with a frequency many, many, many times greater than any other judge did. And I have some statistics on that in my book. So yes, he construed it literally or textually, but then he would say, well, does this result make sense? Is it absurd? And he used it sometimes to add language like par bring partners within a statute that erroneously and nonsensically omitted partners. So yes, he could do that, but he, he took the broadest view of the absurdity doctrine that I've ever seen. Uh, 
Judge Posner, I want to uh, ask a final question of you. Um, yes. along, the, along the dimensions that Professor Rakoff suggested of sort of a judging of, you know, local, practical, pragmatic wisdom and uh, theoretical, social scientific approach, you would be on this dimension a sort of anti-friendly. And yet, in the, your introduction to Mr. Dorson's book, you say you learned a lot about friendly in the book. In fact, you learned some things and you suspect other judges reading the book will learn some things that changed your own practice. Can you tell us anything you learned about Judge Friendly that has uh, influenced your own judging? Um, well, I thought reading the biography, I, I thought it was very challenging because what I thought, my reaction was, I, I should be working harder. <laughs> 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 you know, I have, I have a, I'm a big IQ gap to overcome. So I actually, did, it has had an effect. It, I mean, the biggest effect of reading the biography was I have... I have been working harder on my cases. I want to say something about the debate between Judge Laval and, and Mr. Dorson. I think legal theory is just baloney. And I think you could take originalism, textualism, purposivism, and, and just throw it out. And I think what, a, what, a judge, what, a, what an experienced judge does, or at least the judges I like do, including Judge Friendly, you see a case, and after you study it, you realize there's a sensible outcome, period. You don't have to get into doctrine or anything. There's a sensible outcome. And the question is, can you reach that outcome without you know, inflicting too much collateral damage, right? <laughs> and usually you can. And usually, and usually you can. And you don't have to get into any of that stuff the canons of construction, the absurdity doctrine, the, forget about all that. Just my advice to judges, you know, what, what's a sensible result, which is going to differ from judge to judge, and basically your values and so on, and your personal background and so forth. But, you know, what is a sensible result? And, um, and can, can you get there without doing damage? That, I think, is ought to be the sort of entirety of <laughs> what judges are taught, except the role of social science, it doesn't have anything to do with legal theory. It's that if, you're, if you have an issue, it might be, for example, I mean, we, we have this incredible rash of cases involving child pornography with grotesquely long sentences imposed on the possessors and downloaders on well, a critical question is, what is the, what is the probability of recidivism of uh, these, these pornographers? Uh, should we be giving life sentences, and this is true with drug, the drug dealers also, or can we expect people not to recidivate, at least after a certain age? And that's an issue of social science. That's a scientific issue. That has nothing to do with legal theory. So the judges can use information generated by social scientists, but I don't think they can formulate a theory of adjudication on the basis of social science or anything, I think, except uh, common sense. Well, thank you for that, Judge Posner. I just have to interject as a professor at Harvard Law School. Kids, do not try that at home. I think, <laughs> I think when you get to be an appellate uh, court of federal court of appeals judge, you're entitled to, uh, to that. But I, I know I see sitting here, we have two, two of the oralists uh, uh, for tomorrow's Ames final round. Don't do that, no. <laughs> um, uh, but. Uh, I want to open the floor uh, up to questions. We have a few minutes, and we can have time for a few minutes. This assemblage of dignitaries, it's very rare to have them at your disposal. So I'm happy to pass my microphone to anyone who would like to ask the author, the judges, professors, question. Yes. Um, thank you all. This has just been tremendous. And I, I so look forward to the book. I have a very vivid snapshot of this man. I'm wondering if that snapshot changed for each of you as you knew him over the course of his career. Was this somebody you kept up with, what you developed a relationship beyond that snapshot with? Thank you. 
Judge Laval, Judge Boudin. Well, it certainly changed enormously for me because uh, uh, the the first uh, the first part of the snapshot, as I as I recounted to you, was as an absolutely terrified fledgling fledgling clerk, and it changed in an important way uh, during my year of clerkship, um, when the the first time I mean the, my first period of my clerkship, I contributed absolutely zero of any utility to him. I, I was scared to death and, and I made little little suggestions of slight, what I thought were slight improvements in the, in the um, statement of some proposition and he would sometimes accept them. They meant nothing to him. They were of no importance. The first time I had an idea of disagreement with something that he had written in a footnote, it occurred to me, I thought that he had misinterpreted two cases that he cited in the footnote for a proposition. I, don't, I didn't think the conclusion he came to in, even in that footnote was wrong, but I thought he misdescribed the cases. And I trembled as I sat next to him as to whether I would raise this point or just pocket it and forget it because it wasn't terribly important. And I, um, I fortunately mentioned it, brought it out quaking and he lit up with a glow of delight, just turned red, said, wow, we've got a real disagreement here, let's look at these cases. <laughs> and, and he was so happy, he was so pleased to have gotten a, 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 on a tiny, tiny point, a disagreement from his clerk that he thought, that, that, that he, you can't imagine what joy it gave him to receive <laughs> a disagreement that he liked from a clerk. On the other hand, I, I disagreed with, later on, emboldened by this, uh, I, I disagreed with him on something else later, and when he, and it, it took him only a, a quarter of a second to know he understood your full thing, your full disagreement instantly, and knew as fast whether he liked it or not. And the next time I ventured it, the response I got was something like, <laughs> And that was the end of the consideration <laughs> of, 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 of that point. Um, but um, uh, so my, my view of him changed very much uh, during that year. My, 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 the snapshot that I had and the way that I fit with him in my work changed during that year, but much more so when I had the good fortune to become a district judge in the same courthouse with him and we would have lunch together and things like that, which, uh, you know, I had the the good fortune to develop a, a wonderful social relationship uh, with him. In the last part of his life, he used to come to my house regularly for dinner. Uh, those were wonderful occasions. And anyone else on the panel like to comment? Well, I experienced a change after reading, uh, through reading the book. Um, I mean, I, I always, from the first time I was aware of the man, th marveled at him and thought he was was brilliant and uh, and still do of course I knew very little about the his personal life and I think this book while it's a brilliant book is also one of the saddest books I've ever read the first 80 pages or so may not be exact but about where where the 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 life is described and the particularly the undeveloped relationship with two of the children I just found sad, almost to tears. It just, this is an absolutely brilliant mind, one of the great contributors to our law, but an incomplete human being. And I was just saddened to read this account of it. It needs to be told, I, mean, I have no criticism of the book, it, it's, it's the man, and, and we're entitled to learn it all. But that was certainly a change for me in uh, something I just was totally unaware of. Yes, one of, one of the things Judge Posner says in his introduction is that one of the things you become aware of is that he was, like we all are, many different people. You know, he was the, the family man, the, the public judge, the, the colleague, and he, there were diff, very different qualities that he showed different people. Uh, and his, his family life was indeed very, um, very, very distant from, yeah. from but some what of I did. Love very, there was one, one conversation, which I, I probably among I cherish the most, 
First, because he paid me a compliment, and second, because I got him to laugh. And I only got him to laugh once in the years I overlapped with him. Uh, I, there, it was, the, the case involved the uh, issue of whether something was a question of fact or law. And uh, the other two judges thought it was a question of fact and said that the uh, trial judge had uh, been clearly erroneous. I thought it was a question of law. And I said, had I thought it was a question of fact, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say it was clearly erroneous, but since it was a question of law, I disagreed. And I went on probably at too much length explaining what I thought was the difference. And the phone rang after the slip opinion came out. And uh, he said, I just read your opinion in Antilles. I thought, oh, God, what did I get wrong? He says, how could the other two possibly not agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I recovered enough to say, Henry, don't you ask yourself that every time you dissent? <laughs> and he just roared with laughter. It's the only laugh I ever got out of. Judge um, the, the picture in the book of, of, of his personality and of his relationship and with his family and his satisfaction uh, does reflect what a, a lot of people in and his family uh, said. But it's also true that it may not have been entirely easy for them to appreciate the satisfaction that it seemed to me he got out of his work. He, he did make a choice not entirely uncommon in that period, not unknown today, to make his work uh, and his adoring relationship with his wife the center of, of, of his life. and. Um, no one could have done the work and gotten the acclaim that he got from the craftsmanship of the job without a great deal of satisfaction. He wasn't somebody who showed it all the time, but he became a revered figure. He didn't spend the time doing the academic part uh, out of duty. He did it because he loved these puzzles, and he loved talking about the law, and he loved the law school. And so I, th I think you can get a particularly if you only saw him from the family and didn't see him in his work situation, uh, a slightly distorted impression of, of the satisfactions he got. Now, it did leave him vulnerable when he thought that his work days were coming to an end. And it is a sort of problem of having one- his vision one, trouble. His vision and other problems. And he, he thought his legal career with, uh, to which he devoted his life, was um, was coming to an end. Uh, so he didn't have as many resources as other people would have. But there was a long period. It was not the period of practice, which was very hard-bitten and difficult. Uh, he had a, an extremely demanding principal client, Juan Tripp of Pan American. Doing a good job in cases and negotiations isn't enough in practice. You have to prevail. So it's a, it's a rough business, and it was rougher then. But when he got into uh, judging, which perfectly married these intellectual gifts with practical opportunities to get things right from his point of view, not just the way his client wanted it, it really was in some ways a, a, a a deliverance for him. And he, he did appreciate it. It really meant a lot to him. And he got a lot of pleasure out of that part of it. That's great to know. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Do we have uh, another question or two? No, well, I'll ask the panel if there's anything that uh, they'd like to add. Mr. Dorson, you've, you wrote the book on uh, Henry Friendly, well, I literally. Said, <laughs> well, I've uh, said what I, everything I had to say, I guess. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it, was, it was a fascinating experience, and it was, a, it was difficult. And some of the hardest things that I had to deal with were how to explain his family life and things like that. At times, I knew it would hurt people. I didn't want to overstate it. I didn't want to understate it. And I just, it, it was something I was totally unprepared for in terms of expectation. I just did not understand that I would be called upon, in effect, to make judgments about somebody's 
humanity and things like that, and the fact that he uh, really did neglect two children, and it was, you could almost use the term estranged with two of the three children by overtly favoring the third. I mean, that was a very difficult thing for me to deal with and to explain and not overwhelm the book, and, uh, and they were just judgments I had to make, and uh, it was hard. Yeah, I think, I think the, the book does great credit to the complexity of the man. Uh, as, you know, as a, he, he led a really extraordinary life. Um, and he was, you know, you saw him in his, his complexity in the same way Judge Laval describes him seeing the law and its complexity, all of the different dimensions. And I think uh, it's an incredibly readable book. I, I read it figuring, you know, I am the Henry J. Friendly professor of law. I should, I should read the first biography of Henry Friendly to appear, but I couldn't put it down. Uh, and so with that, I will endorse it to all of you and hope that uh, you will continue uh, your interest in Henry Friendly and, and read this book. And uh, uh, I would like, on behalf, I'd like all of us to thank this distinguished panel, including Judge Posner, for being with us today. Thank you very much.